much of the material I'll be covering, uh, but some new inspectors might not be familiar with the basics of overfill pre prevention, and so that's the purpose of my introductory thing. So here we go. This is a quick introduction to overfill prevention. I, the first question people frequently ask is, why is it important? And the real quick and simple answer is, well, it's required by the regs. And uh, quite frankly, I find that to be a very unsatisfying answer. Uh, overfill pre prevention is very, very important. Gasoline flows out of a tanker truck at approximately 400 gallons per minute. And if something goes wrong, an awful lot of gas can spill in a very, very short period of time. Probably the worst example of an overfill uh, prevention device going awry happened in Biloxi, Mississippi on August 9th of 1998. Uh, on that night, <clears throat> the overfill prevention device did not work correctly. And I'll go into a, a little bit more information on exactly what went wrong a little bit later. But because it didn't work correctly, gasoline flowed down the street, uh, down, ran down the gutter. It probably caught fire from the ignition system of cars that were idling at a stoplight. Fire engulfed three cars. Five people died, and a six-person six person survived, but was very badly burned. It's very easy for us to get caught up in the minutia of regulations, but overfill prevention is one of those devices that simply it, it's just, it's literally, it could be a life or death kind of situation. So with that, let's get back to the regs. In the federal regulations, you'll find the, the requirement for overfill prevention on 40 CFR section 280.20C and for, uh, for existing US systems 280.21D. And virtually all states have identical or very similar requirements in their state regs. So all regulated systems must have one of three things, either a device that stops the delivery when the tank is, is not more than 95% full, that slows down the delivery when the tank is no more than 50% full, or something that will alert the driver with a high level alarm one minute before the tank overfills. So there are a couple of other uh, options in the federal regs. These are not commonly in use. Uh, there are some states that disallow them, but I'm including these, I'm just mentioning these things simply because if somebody looks up those regulatory citations, you will find them. Uh, so one of the options is a device that restricts uh, the flow of 30 minutes prior to overfilling, and another one says you can have a device that automatically stops the flow um, so the product level never reaches the top of the tank. All right, continuing on. The first device, that is one that, that uh, stops, the, stops uh, the delivery product when the tank is 95% full, is not more than 95% full. This is a device that's actually mounted in the drop tube, so it's, of course, hanging down inside the tank. That float... Uh, that you see on the left-hand side hangs out at about a 45-degree angle. When the liquid level rises up, the float switches to about a 90-degree position, and that closes a flapper valve, if you will, inside the fill pipe. Uh, some potential problems with that, uh, if the hose is not attached to the fill pipe, it can come loose, and if the drop tube is not mounted properly inside the fill pipe, the whole unit, the drop tube can just be slammed into the bottom of the tank. Remember, this product's flowing at roughly 400 gallons a minute, and when that valve shuts, there's a tremendous hydraulic shock involved. The next device is commonly known as a ball float or event restriction device. This is something that's, that, again, is mounted inside the tank, and it hangs down inside the tank. It's mounted to the vent line. So as the tank is filled with product, the air that's already inside the tank needs to escape, and it escapes through the opening that you can see on the left-hand diagram. With, when the ball is at the bottom of the cage, the air vapors uh, can go out that pipe. When the product level rises, the ball uh, 
seals that opening and the vapors can no longer escape. Now, I apologize for this incredibly crude diagram. Um, I'm not much of a computer graphics person, but uh, and you'll, you'll notice there's no submersible pump, there's no suction stub, there's all sorts of components that are missing. But I just wanted to show as the, uh, the product goes in through the delivery hose, the liquid arises and of course the air can go right out the vent line. When the tank is close to full, no more than 90%, that ball floats, the air cannot escape, but the product continues to flow through the hose for a while. As it continues to flow, the liquid level rises a little bit more and it creates a cushion of compressed air because the air can no longer get out of the tank. It's the compressed air, that cushion of compressed air at the top, that creates back pressure and it slows down the delivery. And that's how a ball float works. Problems with the ball floats is that if there's any way for the air to get out of the tank. There's another route for the air to go other than the vent line. It won't work because the way these things work is they depend on that cushion of compressed air. They do cause pressurization of the vapor space, which can cause some complications with the vapor recovery systems. And uh, if a tank has a remote fill, uh, that definitely will cause problems. And in fact, that was the cause of the, the fatal accident in Biloxi, Mississippi. The delivery driver had popped the cap off the gauging port, sticked the tank, he had left the cap off, then he connected his hose to the remote fill. Ball float seated exactly as, that, as it was supposed to, but because the, the gauging port was uncapped, the gasoline just flowed right out that sort of created more or less a geyser of gasoline. Uh, the delivery driver unfortunately didn't notice it, and but I've already told that story. So uh, all float valves are not allowed on newly constructed UST systems, according to the federal regs. I guess actually uh, that'll be, I don't want to say that that will be effective uh, in October. If it, I can't remember it's, if it's effective or not. Somebody can set me straight on that. Uh, but regardless of the fact that we don't see them in new installations, there are hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of tanks that are currently equipped with ball floats, and there's no requirement in the federal regs to uh, retrofit. So you will see lots and lots of ball floats out there doing inspections. The third type of device is the audible alarm. This diagram is a little bit confusing because it doesn't show that the three major components are in three different areas. I wish I had the laser the laser pointer working, um, but let me try one thing here. Yeah, Ted, if you try clicking that uh, little silhouetted marker, yeah, the second arrow on that drop down. Yeah, it's for whatever reason it's not it's not doing it. I'm I'm anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is the 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 configuration you see that says electronics housing, that's part of the, the in tank monitor probe. So that portion is inside the tank. The wire then runs to the automatic tank gauge, which of course is inside the building. Then there's another wire that runs to the overfill alarm, and that's supposed to be mounted to the exterior wall of the building, and it needs to be in a position that's both visible or audible from the tank field so that the delivery driver can actually hear it. Um, occasionally, the alarm is put inside the building, and if it's, if it's beeping and flashing a light inside the building, the delivery driver doesn't know that. The other thing, of course, is that all, the, all an audible or visible alarm does is it triggers an alarm. It doesn't do anything to stop the flow into the tank. So the driver really has to be paying attention to stop the flow manually. All right, and now for whatever reason, I I'm, I'm, seem to be unable to advance my slide. I'm not sure what's going on. Drew, any idea what I've done wrong? No, it looks like you're still um, in control of it. I would try clicking the arrow and then maybe your arrow keys. Yeah, 
click an arrow keys, click in space bar, and for whatever reason, my presentation is frozen on this page. I apologize, folks. All right. Well, let me see if I can keep your um, – I'll keep your mic live, and I'll go ahead and advance them for you. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. It, it, we're, we're pretty much at the end of my presentation anyway. Uh, all I was, my next slide would just summarize things. It says, all regulated tanks uh, must be equipped with a device that will either – Stop the delivery at 95% full, slow the delivery down uh, at 90% full, or alert the driver one minute before uh, before this overfills. And that's, that is the very quick, very broad overview. Uh, got any questions, I'm happy to answer them now or at the end of the session. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm sure Bruce Wheelock will have some very interesting examples of how things don't work. They'll always work exactly the way I've described. Thank you all. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ted. Very uh, good start to the training today. And I did get a chance to pull up your uh, your quick summary at the end there. So those, those last three bullet points are up on the screen now for folks to see. And then just advancing here, um, Ted, I'll, I'll go ahead and put your email up at the end of today's presentation. But folks that are watching, um, Ted has provided his, his phone number there as well as his email address. So um, any questions that come up today, feel free to send me uh, those questions for Ted through the chat function, or you can use his contact information uh, in the future. So thank you so much for that introduction, Ted. And as Ted was saying, we'll go ahead and bring Spruce into the conversation to talk more in depth about overfill prevention. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Bruce Wheelock. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Let's see if we can get my presentation up and running here. And of course, that's not in the beginning. Uh, all right. I'll see if I can get my laser pointer working. All right. I got it working. Hey, hey. All right. Great. There you go, Ted. I got it. Ha <laughs> ha. Anyway, it's Bruce Wheelock. Um, I'm from New Hampshire, of course, as they are saying. And we're going to talk about the overfill. And uh, Ted, thank you for the introduction. And I'll try to piggyback a little bit more on on that as we go along here. And of course, come on. There we go. We'll go over the operation. Of course, the maintenance and the importance of manual inspections confirm the operation. We'll look at how some of these devices get compromised and, of course, problems that none of us want to see. So first off, it's a mechanism which stops, restricts, or alerts prior to wetting the inside of the tank. In New Hampshire, all our tanks now are double-walled. In the early days, there were only 360-degree wraps, so the very top section was not uh, double-walled. Uh, currently, with all our new tanks, there are 360-degree wrap, except if you look closely, this is a tank that's been removed that is double-walled, but look at where all the staining is. It's where the fittings are. So currently, most of our contamination in tiles exactly is where all the fittings are, because that's all still single wall. And that's where we're getting most of our contamination these days. Rule considerations as we go through this. Remember, we've got to stop, restrict, or alert. In New Hampshire, we also wrote in the rules to make sure that it's accessible for inspections because we do remove overfill devices during our three-year inspections. It has to be compatible with a delivery method. We'll go over those types of delivery methods currently used. And the other thing that we put in our regulation was you have to register your primary overfill device on the registration form submitted to us. That way, uh, we as inspectors going out there can inspect the proper device. The owner knows what he's relying on. And, of course, the, uh, ins the drivers, the person delivering, or the company can actually go online and actually look up on what we have as one stop to find out exactly what device is installed in each individual tank on a particular site. 
And as Ted was saying, we got the three that we want to talk about. We have the flapper valve, which is initially installed on a fill. We have the ball float, which is on the vent. And the third item, which would be your audible visual alarm. Those are the three that we'll go over. And the first is the flapper valve type. Now, along what Ted was saying, well, you're dropping at three to 400 gallons a minute. And if that valve slams shut, it slows the product down to five gallons a minute because there is a second stage. This, these are designed for second stage so he can actually drain that 14 gallons or more that he actually has in his hose out of it so we don't spill it out on the, on the ground. For example, here's a cutaway that I have, and it's slammed shut. I mean, actually, the flow comes up and brings it up to this point, and it relies on that three to 400 gallons a minute to actually slam this shut. And as an inspector or owner, if you open up your fill and you look down your drop tube, you will see this indentation, which is this indentation here, which is just basically a fuel diversion, so it slams the valve shut. Some of the typical manufacturers, we have OPW, we have MCO Eaton. Now, this one looks very similar to this. Behind that shield, there are two floats. This is your primary shutoff. This is your second stage shutoff. And again, Franklin Fuels, which we'll hear about more later, is again, a two-stage device. That ball float that sets off at 90, remember, we're closing at three to 400 gallons a minute, and again, going down to just five gallons a minute through this bleed hole right here. And there's nothing there to close off the bleed hole. That's why we call it only a restrictive device. Thing to keep in mind when doing inspections with ball float type systems, you have more than one quite often on a tank. You'll have one on a vent, you'll have one on your dry brakes for gasoline, and if you've got an old stage two or a stage two system, you may have a ball float on the stage two system. So if you just inspect one, and if that's not working properly or is installed properly, it might be bypassed by one of these others because these are all quite often manifolded together. Not always, but sometimes they're manifolded together. So be aware that every time you do inspections for ball floats, you've got to look for more than one that is installed on a tank system. Now, ball floats are going to be moving away. Okay, this is a, a universal that I've seen years and years ago here, uh, back in the 90s. I started doing inspections since 90, 1992. We used to find these, and they were set at 95%. Well, unfortunately, in looking at this, if you look down, this is how it looks when it's open, and this is how, what it looks like when it's closed. And if you look closely, you can determine that it does not and will not close off totally. So it is only a restrictive flow device. So with the new EPA regulations, they says no restrictive on vents. Well, that doesn't mean that you can't have a restrictive de device similar to this on your fill. So you might see more and more of these popping up in the future. So be aware of that. And if you're writing rules, you may want to consider how to write rules that that type of device uh, meets your regulation and, and not overfilling the tank, et cetera, et cetera. The third course is your audible visual alarm. In New Hampshire, we actually wrote into our rules that we have to have both the light and the horn. Now, in New Hampshire, we do not regulate drivers to say that you have to be able to see and hear um, for, for drivers. So we want to have both. Um, I'd hate to see a driver that's both deaf and blind, but I suppose there could be a, easily could be a driver out there that could be deaf. We do not regulate saying that you have to be able to hear. We also put in our regulations, which wasn't there first, is that you have to have a sign posted. In the old days, we didn't have that, and when I went out to do an inspection, I'd look at the site and i say, okay, I'm here as a first-time driver, and I'm doing a delivery, and this happens to be a school. And I notice, sir, that your overfill device is your audible visual alarm. Where is it? And he'd say, well, it's 300 feet over there on the side of the school building. Jeez, if I'm a driver, this is the first time here, and I'm in, I know I'm at a school. If I see that light and horn go off, what, what would I think? Ha ha, I can't get any of you guys to answer me, because nobody can hear me, and I can't see you, sorry. Well, the fact is, what I would be thinking is uh, recess, 
or is it a fire alarm? So we actually put in our regulations that physically has to have a sign explaining what it is so everybody understands this is for an audible overkill alarm for your underground tank. Now, I also want to point out, we also put in our regulation that it has to be manually reset. There was a problem that we were initially having is that the alarm would go off, the light would blink, and go out. Well, if the driver wasn't staring at it, he'd never see it. And the second item was that the audible has to be on for at least 10 seconds and could, aut could automatically shut off after, after that. But again, when we didn't have this in the regulation, the audible could go off beep and drive you standing right beside a road. How do you know if it wasn't that truck that backfired that drove by? So we wanted to make sure that the actual driver knew that this was an overfill device that he needs to uh, jump into action. We also put in as our primary. Now, when I say primary, that means this is the one we're inspecting. They could have audible alarms installed as a secondary and backup if they so choose. We do allow that. That's why we go into the primary. So if you're relying on a primary, we also require that if you're going to do delivery of more than one product at a time, you're going to need a separate light and horn. It only makes sense. Because if you're dropping diesel and dropping gas at the same time, which tank is full? It goes an alarm, which one's full? You don't know. So we have to have a second light and horn. Now, the other thing I want to mention is we also test in the field, and we've had a lot of problems with, is you'll take that first one, set it into alarm, pull the probe out, set it in alarm, light goes off, horn goes off. Now, remember, it has to reset before you can do a second delivery. Otherwise, you'd never know when the second tank is full. We also, we, you have to leave it in alarm because, of course, tank's full and nobody's using the product that fast, so it stays in alarm, needs to be reset, and you set the, sen the second tank sensor and you pull it out and set it off. And quite often what we've been finding is that the second one wouldn't even register. So in that case, they need to do some more research and decide that needs new software or a whole new separate leak monitoring system, alarm system, et cetera, et cetera, to, to satisfy. Because you've got to have a, an operable, of course, overfill to do a second delivery after that first one went into alarm. And that first method of delivery that I was talking about is gravity. And like Ted said, three to 400 gallon minute delivery time on a four inch hose, 20 feet long, holds about 14 gallons. And we do allow, of course, tight connections and loose connections, whereas the loose connection quite often for us would be uh, a used oil tank where you have a gas station that may change oil in an automobile, go out there and just pour it in this underground tank both acceptable. But keep in mind, 14 gallons in his hose, if he overfills, and how many gallons is in that spill bucket? What size? As we all know, five gallons is the minimum size it has to be, but if he's got 14 gallons, of course, there's your red flag of the next possible problem of him delivering product out on your concrete pad. Pressure delivery, usually a pump system 30 to 75 pounds of pressure, because a lot of these are home heating oil type uh, systems where they have to pump up to a, a tank that's either above ground or a house or, or a small diesel tank, et cetera. And they can pump anywhere from somewhere 40 gallons, and I've seen them up to 300 gallons a minute. Generally, they'll use a tight connection, but we do allow a loose connection. Here's a particular truck that's been set up to do ideal everything. It can do gasoline, diesel, heating oil. It has your pump right here with your pump connection for your normal heating oil. It has your gravity four inch connection there, plus for gasoline it's got your vapor recovery turn line. So a multi purpose truck. So that's your delivery method there. Now we got into device delivery compatibility. Keep in mind Audible visual alarm is the only device that will work for both gravity and pressure. Because if you stop and think, if you're doing a pressure delivery and you have a flapper valve which closes, what's there to shut off the pump from pumping? Nothing. You have a ball float. 
that closes. Closes it down from that three to 400 gallons a minute down to five gallons a minute. And if he's pumping in at 60, 70, 80 gallons a minute, and it's only allowing five gallons a minute out, it's not going to shut the pump off. Something is about to break. So pressure deliveries, audible visual alarm only. Flapper valve. Again, gravity only with a tight connection and cannot have ball floats. Okay, and why can't we have ball floats? Well, as we were talking before, the ball float closes at 90%. We're relying on a flapper valve, which closes at 95%. So if he's closed off at 90% down from that three to 400 gallons a minute down to five gallons a minute, there's nothing there to slam that valve shut. All right, so quite, off, quite oftenly the uh, flapper valve will not work uh, because there's nothing there, no pressure, head pressure to, enough to slam it shut. Now, ball floats. Again, gravity only and a tight connection. You need to check for your multiple ball floats, your vents, your dry brakes, and your vapor recovery, of course. Because as Ted was mentioning, when the ball flow closes, the vapors, the air, is wanted to escape any place it possibly can. Again, as we were talking about that coaxial drop tube, you drop your product down through the inner tube, the vapors come up around the outside back to the tanker truck. Well, the ball flow closes off the vent, but there's nothing there to close off, close off this pathway back to your tanker truck, so it bypasses. Also, if you have a suction pump dispenser, they're designed to have an air eliminator installed, which basically spurts out any trapped air in the pump which is actually in a dispenser. And so the reason for that is you cannot suck product up out of a tank unless the pump is primed. In other words, you can't pull air up out of a tank. You have to have liquid in the line in the pump to pull up. So they install what they call an air eliminator in the dispenser. So when you shut it off, there's a little air that gets trapped in there. It spurts it out. Well, in the year since 1992, every time I ask a contractor, have you cleaned out your air limiter in these suction systems? And I've yet to find a single contractor to say, well, gee, I do that on a yearly basis. Well, what happens is you get a little bit of grit or dirt in your product. That now holds that air eliminator open constantly. And so, like Ted was mentioning, as that ball flow closes, now you build a pressure in the top of the tank all the way at the product line out to the dispenser, and if that air eliminator is held open with dirt, now you've got a stream of liquid running out underneath each dispenser every time you get a delivery and that ball flow closes. Compatible device cheat sheet that I put together for, for owners and delivery drivers. Talks about the delivery method, your fill connection, your audible alarm, your flapper valve, or your ball float, what will work, what won't work. Also, what some states allow is the vent whistle for small tanks. Here in New Hampshire, we currently do not allow that type of device, but some states may. Also, we're dealing with the pump type. Is it a pressure or is it a suction with a suction dispenser? And do you have vapor recovery? This is just a little cheat sheet that we put together for drivers and, and owners, of course, to go back and decide what they actually have and will work. So right now I want to stop for the first time here and ask for questions. And Drew, do we have any questions? Yeah, I do have one. And uh, just a reminder to the audience, uh, feel free to use the chat function to send me questions whenever they pop up for you. But the question, Spruce, um, is there any liability incurred by removing and inspecting a fill or drop tube? Okay, we adding to liability. With the state of New Hampshire, what we require in per our regulations is it has to be accessible to us. And that means to us is we work in the sense that it's hands off. We do not touch the equipment. The owner owns it. They can hire a contractor if so they so choose, or they can remove the overfill device themselves. But they, by our regulation, are required to 
show us that everything's functioning and working properly. So the liability is on them. They own the equipment, not us. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, and whoever asked that question, feel free to send me a, a follow-up if you want further clarification from Spruce. That's it for now, Spruce. All right. Right now, I don't want anybody falling asleep. I hear these heads falling down and landing on the tabletop. I want to take about a minute or two minutes for everybody to stand up and stretch, and then we'll continue on. I don't want anybody uh, falling asleep. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to go get your glass of water, stretch, and whatever else, and then we'll continue on. How's that? Sounds great. Uh, panelist orders everyone, stand up, take a stretch, and we'll return in a couple minutes. Thanks, Bruce. Well, Drew, any other questions come in while we're stretching? No. All right. I can uh, might as well. Yeah, Bruce, I can ahead. take a stab. I got, I got uh, sort of a question or maybe just okay. a request for elaboration on remote fills. Um, no auto shut, no ball float on remote fills. I'm not sure what the question is, but could you comment on that at all, if that provides enough clarity to comment? I think I might be able to answer that as we go through this. Great, um, perfect. I will be talking about remote fills, and maybe that'll answer that question as we go through this. All right, let's if do it. Not, uh, you can he can uh, bring it up and say, yeah, I got more clarification I'd like, but all right, let's get moving along again then. In New Hampshire, and like most of the states will have to do, is verify our proper operation installation every three years. Well, currently in our requirements, we have our deadline is December 22nd this year, and then every three years after they've actually did the test. So we're kind of ahead of the ball in that respect. Ball floats, here's a couple of examples. We have that standard ball float on the left, which we have the eight inch, I mean eight inch, excuse me, one eight inch hole for the bleed. Whereas, some, as Ted was mentioning, some of the states are, are relying on different methods such as a 30 minute overfill device. And that has a 16th inch hole. And also, the way you can look at these and determine which type of device is, that 30 minutes usually has a, a wraparound cage, and the ball quite often doesn't have a seam in it, or it does not have these little divots in it, and it doesn't have these holes in here along the cage. And the reason for that is, of course, is it's relying on that ball to set, uh, excuse me, seat firmly into the tube. Also, what's missing here when you do inspection is there's supposed to be a gasket here. So if the gas gets missing, et cetera, et cetera, this is not operating properly. In New Hampshire, we do not allow the 30-minute ball float. Uh, back in the uh, mid, mid to early 90s, we had a, an owner, a big owner, that wanted to install them, and we had the manufacturer come in and talk with us and give us some calculations and so forth. We were not satisfied because they were not able to supply the information to us saying that if a truck drove up and installed and hitched up to a full tank that was already full by mistake and started the delivery, do we indeed have a 30-minute overfill device? And the reason for that is the pressure of the tank was beyond what their equipment 
testing equipment could provide to us, and they were not able to evaluate out any further, so we've never had them uh, go any further with us. So we've got the standard ball float, which is set at 90% currently. I also, as an inspector, I says, okay, we're going out to an existing site. I need to figure out if that ball float meets our regulations. So as an inspector, I, I was always scratching my head. So I put this uh, cheat sheet together to try to determine that I, what the overfill valve is. I can actually give this to the contract of the owner um, if we weren't able to determine that at the time I was doing the inspection. They could fill out the information and submit it to us to prove to us that the ball float actually meets the 90%. It's just a cheat sheet I've made up. Here's a cutaway regarding to the extractor and a ball float that's installed. It screws down into the extractor. The approximate elevation of the inside of the top of the tank could be somewhere in this vicinity here. They all vary because the bung that this thing screws into could be welded a little higher, a little lower, uh, in each tank that's manufactured. But in generic-wise for an inspector, I, this tube right here is actually the length, and it will come out very close to the actual tank top. So we use that as quite often as our, our reference point. Again, for that 30 minute, it's very complicated. Uh, we won't get into the details on that, but I did put a cheat sheet together on, in, in regarding to how to figure that out in the field. OPWs, the 61, the 71 SOs, their installation that quite often came to the contractor what I want to warn people is, in New Hampshire, we require that this is a shut, uh, what do I want to say, complete shutoff at 95%. That's what our regulation says, complete, not initial. And what they were doing is, uh, this set of instructions was, if you look closely here, it'll say initial shutoff. And so we reached out to OPW and it says, okay, well, in New Hampshire, we have to have a complete shutoff, not at, not at 95 uh, initial, because with this initial, you'll find that the complete shutoff won't be until you get to somewhere in the 98% uh, fill range. So what they came out to us and said, well, if you use the calculation for 92 versus 95, and you stall it through these calculations at 92, you will get the same um, complete shutoff at 95%. They have also come up with new, inst new install instructions that actually uses the 92 and gives you the proper procedure to do that. So that is available. So make sure they follow, for us, they've got to make sure that they're following the correct uh, installation requirements. MCO Wheaton, again, um, has theirs. they got 97 over here, so you don't want to use those for us. We have to use the complete shutoff at 95. Also, when you're an inspector, you've got to be considering manways. Here we have the AB in a manway, if you have a manway, which is, sits on top of the tank to take into your calculations. And when I say manway, this, this is a typical manway that might be on top of a tank. And if you're measuring, you may only measure down to this point because you, you can't reach down to the top of the tank. So you need to make an adjustment for that. Here's some examples of what you might find in the field. One of the big giveaways here, if you look at this, the tank might be installed lengthwise this way, and you say, well, that means this is not on top of the tank, it's off to the side, off to the side. Well, that means you probably have a manway because it's, they don't really want to screw the, the connections into a non-flat space on the side of a tank, so here we got a manway covered top. Here's another example that you might find that same scenario, they'll have a sump underneath. And here's a typical uh, manway on a fiberglass tank. It's actually built up, you got the plate, and then you screw in your extractors and your fills, et cetera, et cetera, right on the top of the, the manway. So you've got to take into account that four, three to four or five inches possibly uh, down into the tank from wherever your valve is sitting. Here we have an example of a float that's sitting out like it should be. Whereas this one is so gummed up that it's actually, when we pulled it out, it's in this position, which to me means that it's probably not going to pop out and float up. And as, as an inspector, we have a lot of problems with this hinge up here for this type of device. 
And I've always asked, I says, can you design me what I call as a spruce spring scale? Uh, what's acceptable pressure or resistance when pulling up on here to say that this will float and won't float? You know, can I give a pass-fail on a device? And currently we just kind of estimate. Sometimes you'll pull up on the float, it'll stick right up out here and never come back down, so you, therefore you can't take another delivery because it's already closed. It just won't, won't reset. But there's a lot of times when there's so much resistance that we're saying that this thing will never, never, ever float and you'll just overfill your tank. Other things to consider when measuring down into your bottom of your tank, you may measure all the way down and find one of these, and you're actually not on the bottom of the tank, you're actually on this button, which is resting on the bottom of the tank. And anybody have a guess what that's for? I can't hear anybody. Well, I guess I'll have to answer it then. Well, what it's for is it's basically a stick plate. Back in the old days when the old arborglass tanks were being built. They never had a plate that was actually on the bottom of tanks. And so when people were dropping their inventory stick down, and every time they do a measurement, ding, 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 and then they would punch a hole right through the bottom of the tank. Well, they quite often install this additional device to uh, use as a stick plate. With this type of overfill device, being it's a flapper that flaps out, well, we've got to make sure that we have a minimum 14 inches before we run into the end of the tank. So if we twist this thing around and face this way, that flap might be coming right up and hit the end of the tank. And if that's the case, if it's close enough to the end of the tank, it would come up, boom. And therefore, the valve would never, ever shut. So you've got to be careful on when you're inspecting to make sure that the flap is actually running down the length of the tank, but not sideways either. Because if you remember, the tank top is round on top. So if you put this valve in and it's facing to the side, you could actually, the flap actually come up and hit the side of the tank because the tank is round. And then also would not close. So those are the things you need to look check for when you're doing your, your inspection. MCO Eaton's and EBW's, to verify operation with these, we have a screw. We also have another plug here. These you would remove. And then here you can put, in this particular device, you put a 764 wrench, Allen wrench in, and you can actually spin this, and you can actually get the valve to close. Of course, in order to do that, you have to lift, lift up on the float, but that means you can release it, you'll see it will actually activate. And with the EBW, you take the screw out, and you can actually take a, a, a thin Allen wrench or a screwdriver and actually push down in here and actually push on the valve and you can push it close to see if, again, these hinges are working properly and the valve will actually shut. Here's that remote fill I was talking about. You need to have some consideration when you're doing an overfill. All right, the valve closes. Well, it closes. Remember, we had that 14 gallons I was talking about in the hose. We also have all the product that's in this remote fill, depending on how long it is, you know, maybe half a gallon or so per foot, or more, depending on the size of the remote fill, uh, that be sitting right here in this that has to be drained down into the tank. Now, for a ball float, it closes. Well, you've got all this product that after he shuts off still has to drain down in the tank with wet, without wetting the inside of the tank. So, same with an audible alarm. Um, hopefully that answers his question regarding to remote fills. We do allow them, but you've got to take into consideration your, your calculation you may have to set this valve actually a little bit deeper um, so that you will not be wetting the inside top of the tank. Elevation difference, which a lot of people don't really think about. And in New Hampshire, we do require plans to be submitted to us for major alterations or new installs. And we'll run into where um, they want to, let's see, manifold two tanks together with a siphon bar. Well, if the overfill device is set for 95% in this particular tank, you fill it to this level. But this tank over here was actually, uh, an older tank was an uh, older installation. It's set at a lower elevation. Well, now, as you fill up and that siphon bar pulls product up back and forth, you're actually filled all the way up to this point 
in that siphon line, so you've overfilled this particular tank and wetted the inside top of the tank. So you may need to adjust this overfill device down lower in this tank so that you will not overfill this tank. Something to consider. Uh, not a lot of people looking for that. Oh, you be aware of that. And it, it happens to us. We see it when they do tank top upgrades. When everybody had to meet our regulations for double wall, they did a lot of tank top upgrades. Uh, we got rid of the plus tanks, and we decided, well, we want two regular tanks and a super tank. So now you've got these manifolded and, and siphoned together, and we run into a lot of problems with that. When they change products, go from diesel to gas and, and add two gas tanks instead of one diesel and one gas. Remember, when they're tied together, this is what can, what can happen. So when you're doing your rule writing, you may also want to consider um, having a requirement they post this setting in the site, on you know, on the site somewhere with the regulations, I mean, with the, all the requirements. Because in the future, as we all know, overfill device will have to be replaced because of it failed or new regulations. Uh, we had a lot of problems with with finding things like this. Is when contractors came in and with the vape recovery and and dealing with the the two inch test, and everybody was replacing all the drop tubes throughout the state and contractors are just running right in and says, oh, it only has to be 11 inches deep. How come it's down two feet? I don't know. Just slap one in at 11 inches. We found that pretty common. So FYI, you may want to think about that when you're doing your rules and regulations again. I found this device. It's an older OPW that I hadn't seen in New Hampshire, but I did this when I did a peer match um, um, get-together years ago. We saw this device, and I scratched my head, and I said, this is an overfill, all right. Well, we had the contractor come out the next day. We pulled it out and took a look at things. Well, you see this little crossbar right here? Well, when, it, when it's shipped, it's in this position. When you install it, you've got to take this, this bar out, and you turn it around, flip it all the way around, and install it the other way. And the reason why it's in there one way for shipping is so that this flap doesn't flop around back and forth, boom, 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 during shipping and destroy the valve. They had never, when they installed it, never took this out and flipped it around. And they said that it had been installed for uh, 8 to 10 years. And I says, well, that's great. That means the valve has never closed ever since day one it was installed. And they said, well, the contractor is supposed to be verified that it's working properly. But you know, a lot of people say a lot of things. But we also found... The, uh, there's a spring in here, and it has a uh, gasket in here because it's um, pressure related to, to release this valve, and there's a little tube that runs down. Well, this had all rotted out, so this valve was actually not working because of that also. Just a different type of installation, manufacture type overfill. Okay, I'll take another couple minute break, and we'll have a couple questions if you've got any questions, and did I answer that on the remote fill? You did. Uh, you did, and I do have a couple couple questions. Um, so one, uh, quite a few slides back here, specific to the uh, the bleed hole. So could you say more about what the bleed hole is and uh, what is bleeding to where? Okay, and I believe your question is regarding to the ball float. And what we talk about is a bleed hole, which is at the top of the ball float, which could be a sixteenth inch, eighth inch, depending on the type of device. And what it means is that as you're doing product delivery into your underground tank, product is now coming up and the vapors are expelling out, as what Ted was talking about, through your vent. Well, when that ball seats, well, basically what it says now, air cannot go out that vent. But right now, the air is actually going through that little uh, bleed hole. Okay, so now... It slows the product delivery down from that three to four hundred gallon minute down to five gallons a minute because that's how how much restriction there is for that little bleed hole. So air continually runs through that bleed hole until you fill up product all the way to the bleed hole level, and then now you'd be pushing bleed um, pushing product through the bleed hole out your vent. A little little additional item I'll mention to that is. Uh, we rely on flapper valves, and we go out and do inspections, and they set, as I said, 95%. Well, if you have a ball float installed, 
and I do an inspection, and, oh, geez, we can't have that because it closes at 90. Well, okay, I'll just punch the ball out. Granted, okay, so that opens up the air pathway, and that's fine. What people don't understand is even if the ball is not there, you, now as air gets, as, excuse me, as the product gets up to where the tube is, okay, the ball doesn't float up because it's not there. But the air that's trapped above the ball float is trapped there now because it can't get out the, the two-inch um, tube up the ball. So right now you start compressing the air in there, and now you, as you build up pressure, now you're going to be starting to push product up that ball float out the vent. And people don't realize that because you trap the air in. The air can't get out only at five gallons a minute, but that hole is a lot, that two-inch hole is a lot bigger than that five, you know, that quarter-inch hole that the air is trying to get through. So they say, well, we never, we didn't overfill, but we got product up our vent line and it blew out the tank. Well, that's because um, that was the easiest place for the air, the product to get out was out the vent. Hopefully that answers the question. That's a great answer. Uh, I have another question about um, flapper arms. So how can an, an inspector tell whether a flapper arm is too long and would therefore strike the side of the tank before being activated? Okay, if it's too long. Well, that particular manufacturer had in the instructions 14 inches. Okay. That's what they're saying. It has to be a minimum from that distance. Now, how, as an inspector, that is mostly guesswork. Um, you can guess and say, well, a drop tube's right next to this so that if I line it up, the, the flap will hit the drop tube. So that's obvious. But there's no real way to determine that it'll, where it is going to where the tank end, end of the tank is. That's all guesswork. And if you can go facing into the tank, great. If you, you're forced to go to the end of the tank and it's guesswork because you don't know if you got the 14 inches, you're just hoping they didn't put the bung that close to the end of the tank, which generally they don't, but uh, there's no way for you to be 100% sure. Think you got time for one more here? Sure. So for sites that have a 30-min ball float installed and states that have allowed 30-min ball floats, would they be in compliance? if that ball float was install, installed to restrict above 90% tank capacity? So I think the question is, a 30-minute ball float, can you set it at 98, 97? Um, and the, the, the quick answer to that is, the way the 30-minute ball float means, it could be set anywhere in the tank as long as you, you have the design and the approval to say that It'll take 30 minutes after that's closed before you wet the inside top of the tank. So yes, in theory, you could be higher than 90%. And that's one reason why they want to use a 30-minute ball float is I want to put it at 98 or 99%. But you've got to show proof that it'll be 30 minutes before it wets the inside top of the tank, and that's what this one company couldn't prove if I hitched up with a full tanker truck by accident. Of course, there's never been an accident. Humans are perfect. That's why we don't have to have overfill devices, right? Of course. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, yeah, keep the questions coming, everyone. Uh, keep the awesome answers coming as well, Spruce, and I'll uh, defer back to you to keep things moving. All right. Why don't we just stand up and stretch again for another, let's say, another minute so I can have All a right. dr drink of water here. Sure. Feel free to send me questions, folks. We'll take a minute and get started again. Any more questions popping up? 
Yeah, so uh, one is specific to New Hampshire and equipment. So the question is, does New Hampshire allow OPW 61 F-stop, EBW Guardian, in-kind flapper valves for tight pressurized deliveries? I will get to that. <laughs> All right. Yes. The answer to that is yes, and I will be getting to that shortly. All right, I think we're good to proceed whenever you're ready. Okay, we'll roll right along then. Let's talk about problems. All right. Obvious one here on the left. You're missing half the float. Broke right off. This one in the middle is interesting. And the interesting part is the contractor says, Well, we were out here two weeks ago and did a pre inspection, and I don't remember seeing this. So, what is that there for? Two guesses. I can't hear anybody. Darn. Well, the first guess I would say is uh, I had a hose clamp I didn't know what to do with. And the second is, well, if I put a hose clamp on here, that means this valve right here will remain down here will never, ever close. And me, the truck driver, can say, well, if I put that on there, and I've got an extra 200 gallons on my truck that won't fit. If I put that on there, I can stuff that tank full, and I won't have to drive away with two extra 200 gallons on my truck. <sighs> anyway. These are the things that we find when we do our inspections. We also find this bottom drop tube. This one here was just barely hanging on with one little uh, connection. These other two had actually broken away, so the, the tube was just kind of dangling there. And there's been times that we actually pull out these valves, and the bottom the bottom section is actually floating around in the bottom of the tank somewhere. They fall right off. So these are some of the reasons that we do actually remove tanks, I mean the overfill devices. Why else do we remove them? Well, here we have, and this is a, the upper section of a drop tube, the, the flapper valve is here. They drilled a hole in here, quarter inch hole. Why? Well, as the owner said, well, that's because when we go out there to stick the tank before delivery, and the product in the drop tube is actually different than what it is out here in the tank. So we drill a hole in there so the product in the tube and in the liquid level of the tank will be at the same level. And then after they do a delivery, they both equalize so that we'll get an accurate reading. Well, I asked him, I says, you know, by doing that, does that bypass your complete shutoff of your valve? Uh, uh, yeah, because there's nothing that stops product from flowing out here into your tank during a delivery. Yes. Just bypass your overfill device. It's no longer a complete flow shutoff device. Now, I, I borrowed this picture. It's a neat one. This is not found in New Hampshire. But if you look at this device, now here's the top section where they, top of the tank where they fill it. You look at it and you look real close. You look at this close and you look at this and you look at this and you go, huh, would you believe this valve is actually installed upside down? Lovely. So if the valve's installed upside down, will it ever close and shut off? I don't think so. So interesting. Humans never make mistakes. Never. Flapper valve, yep. This one's popped out just like it should. This one's not popped out. It's all corroded. This hinge is all corroded. All this rust and corrosion had gummed up this hinge so the valve would never even operate. Same with this one. It's just stuck in the vertical. It's so gummed up to the point that this float won't even float. I took this picture, and this was a new installation. What happened is this float right here has these little arms here that hook right onto the pivot point. Well, when they pulled this valve out, guess what? One of these broke off. And believe it or not, this was, like I was saying, a brand new installation, and our inspector went out. We inspect new installations and ask the contractor to remove the device so we can measure it to make sure it was set at the proper 95% per the, the design drawings, and it broke. So things do happen, accidents do happen. 
Um, and then I believe that we find less and less of that currently. So that's hopefully they resolve that situation. And you saw all that corrosion running down the tube. And this is because the owner, the, what we have is the AB operator, was not keeping that spill bucket clean and free of liquid. Water built up in the spill bucket to the point where here you have your adapter that screws right on your riser pipe. This is all threaded. And this adapter, if it's not on tight, water now runs between here through the threading and down between your flapper valve and your riser pipe down to the top of the tank, causing all that corrosion and rust, which runs down on that hinge and, and plugs up the, the actuator. Another one that we find, corrosion hole. Here we have the whole riser pipe corroded right through. We were, I was actually at a site I was going to do a pressure decay test, and it wouldn't pass, and this is what we found big rust hole in the corrosion in the riser pipe. So those are the things that we got to look for when we do our inspections. That's why we need to remove the devices. Uh, one of my inspectors found this. In this situation, he was doing the UST inspection. The driver drove up, doing a pressure delivery, ran his tube down, which was similar to this. Okay, a whistle stick, basically is what they quite often call them. And he was filling the tank. This has a flapper valve type device like this installed. And that tube ran right down like this, right past the flapper valve, holding it open. So now when you try to float it up and float and close, it will not close. So he asked the driver, well, how do you know the tank is full? You know, the valve is being bypassed. Oh, yeah, I know that. Well, that, he says, that's obvious. I just look down the tube here, and then when I see the product coming up into my face, I know the tank's full. Yay, 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 yay. So needless to say, he was breathing all the fumes as he's doing a delivery, number one. Number two, did he wet the inside top of the tank? You betcha. So did he possibly cause contamination to that site? You betcha. So things not to do. <laughs> we don't allow that. Again. Like I was mentioning before, see, he's doing a pressure delivery. And what they say was the only thing that would work for a pressure delivery, this won't work. We have to have the audible visual alarm. So if he knows it's 90% full, the alarm goes off because you can't rely on this. Another one that they like to do is drop that inventory stick down in the tube. Oh, let's see. I would find that every couple months. I'd find a stick like this down with that flapper valve. And what's it there for? Again, it was there just to do the same as this. Hold that flapper valve open so he could cram the extra 200 gallons into that tank and not drive and drive away. Or the valve was broken. Another site, I, can, I walk behind the building. The tanks are on the other side of this fence and I see these inventory sticks here. And I go, I look at them and I say, you know, these inventory sticks are a little bit short. I wonder why. Well, because what happens is they break off the inventory stick short enough so that it slides into the tank. Now, if it's down below the, the adapter up there, he can still attach his valve onto here and do a delivery. So he drops in, does the delivery, pull, and he's a smart guy. He pulls these inventory sticks out when he leaves, so the valve closes, so nobody knows that he bypassed the overfill device. So I tell all the inspectors, you see that? Make sure that the owner sees that and you break them up and throw them away so they cannot use those to bypass the valve. Because either he, the owner, is bypassing it or his delivery driver is bypassing it. So FYI. Other problems that we have, here we got a ball float that I pulled out. All right, no ball. There's a little spot weld that's right at the very ends of these. And what happens is sometimes when they install the ball float, that little spot well breaks, and then, of course, this ball just kind of floats away and floats around inside the tank. In this particular case, we pulled it out, and whatever gunk that they had when they probably installed it slid down in here and around the ball and actually caused the ball to stick right to the cage so the ball wouldn't float. This one here, well, we do regulate heating oil here in New Hampshire. This is number six heating oil. And it was so gooey, of course, that the ball actually stuck right to the cage. And they just kept filling, overfilling and overfilling and overfilling. 
just all grouped up. This one down here, interesting. What is that? Well, what it is, they had this scenario. No ball. So the guy says, aha. And he did this two weeks prior to we doing the inspection because we announce our inspections and therefore the owner or a con they have a contractor come out. They knew it wasn't there, so he did this. Well, great. Except for the big question is, this is a plastic orange that they took out and put in here to replace the ball. What's wrong with that? Well, I don't know. It's brand new. still got the label on it. Except for, I said, plastic orange, plastic orange, plastic and petroleum. A uh, little bit of a problem there regarding to uh, the quality of the plastic. It probably dissolve in a matter of weeks or months. Who knows? Definitely would deteriorate. So petroleum, plastic, plastic orange, uh, no good. It was a good thought. Good thought, but sorry. I, it amazes me how often I find this situation. Hole in the ball. Okay? When they put these balls together, there's two halves, and they usually, I believe, they put them together and they seam seal them. And this is a, a pivot point where they hold them together and it stretches the metal. But all of a sudden you have a hole here. Now, maybe it was manufactured with a hole in it. It was delivered with a hole in it. I don't know. Or one just pops up. But I find them all the time. You pull these out and all of a sudden you've got this wet spot. And because of the hole, of course, it's full of liquid. And, of course, if it's full of liquid, it won't float. It won't work. The other one I had was this. I found this in here when I pulled the ball float out, which was... Just like this. Well, during manufacture and shipping, they put this cardboard in here to hold the ball in the, that position when they're shipping it. So the ball doesn't go bang, 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 and destroy itself during shipping. Well, lovely contractor never even removed the cardboard. I, I actually found that situation, and it probably had been in four or five years before I did my first inspection and found it, so... The ball flow never worked from day one. Other things I find regarding to when I inspect ball floats, debris on top of the ball. I'll find broken caps, covers, little pieces that are, you know, plastic covers, metal covers, whatever, you know, the shards of it, broken when they broke it off to get into it. And they're just sitting down on top of the ball and holding the ball from floating. Right day break. Adapters, especially the aluminum ones, when they broke those off, and you got the plastic that's in the bottom of those little pieces of plastic floating down in there. Gaskets, just the, the rubber gaskets. When they took the dry break off, it, the, the old gasket just falls down in and holds the ball down. Pipe dope. They over dope it, and all the pipe dope flops down in there, and it just gums up the ball. Rusty metal. I've seen tools sitting on top of the ball, and even sunglasses. Believe it or not, sunglasses sitting on top of the ball. It's amazing what you find. And, and other things I found, or in spill buckets, I found even a horseshoe crab once. I go, in a spill bucket? And, and we're 80 miles away from the coast. I go, oh, God. The things that people put in the places they shouldn't be. Other problems, here we have an adapter from one manufacturer and a cap from another factory that don't quite fit. So we'll just zip tie it. Well, another problem, we have our spill buckets with drain valves. Quite often with your drain valve, the way it operates is you pull up on the chain and you drain whatever product of water down into your tank. But especially here in New England, we have a lot of salt and sand during the winter. Wind blows across here, gets down into your spill bucket, and as soon as they open that up, it goes down into in, in between the valve here. And so when they close it, there's sand stuck in there holding this valve open continuously. Now vapors are continuously coming up into the spill bucket. And in this scenario I found, we were called to do an inspection at a particular facility. We had a complaint or a couple complaints by people out there filling their cars up and, and a delivery going on at the same time, and all they could smell was gasoline. So when I went out there to do an inspection, 
I was scratching my head. The ball float looks good. Everything's set properly. And then when we went to the ATG cap, I opened this up, I found this, just like that. Now, uh, if you look, an ATG cap is supposed to have these both these arms and these hooks to hold the cap on. Well, that was all corroded away. This had actually popped off. And if you remember what Ted was saying, you do a delivery with ball floats. You drop the product in, the ball float closes up, and you compress the air inside. Well, when you compress air, the air is going to want to go wherever the weak spot is. Okay? The weak spot happened to be this cap. It just blew it right off. So now all the vapors are continuously coming out through here because the ball float had already closed. Now, where are the vapors going? Right here. And this happens to be right at ground level, and it happens to be about 10 feet away from where the dispensers were, these tanks were. So that's why they were smelling all that gasoline. And again, if the valve for your spill bucket is held open from dirt, where do you think the vapors are going? And it's bypassing the ball flow because all the vapors are, again, coming out here. And the same with this. This cap is not on tight because it's held with zip ties, but it's not airtight. So vapors, again, were spewing out in this ATG cap here. Some of the problems that we have with ball floats. Remember what I was talking about tank deliveries? Vertical feet to a ball float is more than 11 feet. Okay, because if you've got a tanker truck, if he's full, he's about 11 feet off the ground where his product is. Now, if you talk about head pressure of that 11 feet of product up above ground, then you've got another three or four feet down to the top of your tank. So you might have, you know, 15, 16 feet down to the inside top of the tank where the ball float is or where your tank begins. FYI, 11 and a half feet equals five pounds of pressure. And this is where I usually ask everybody, how many pounds of pressure can your underground tank withstand? And the answer is five pounds. So if you go over five pounds of pressure, this is what might happen. Okay, you blow a seam right out of the tank, wherever the weak link is. Also, if you have a tank or a riser pipe, in this particular case, blow a rust plug right out. This isn't a riser pipe. Okay, when we were trying to do a test and we couldn't get the vapor to, um, recovery pressure decay test to pass, this is what we found. This was this riser pipe was rusted right through, and when we were trying to do the test, apparently it was just enough to push the air right through here and blow the rust plug out and cause a leak. So with ball floats, it could very easily overpressurize a tank, split it out. And if you're pumping in with a ball float, and have a ball float in, well, what's to stop the pump? Nothing. So you quickly could go above five pounds of pressure and cause this with a pressure delivery method. I was doing an inspection for a site for a diesel generator, and they had on record ball float. Well, I found no access for a ball float in the top of the tank, and I asked, where is your ball float? He pointed over here. This is his vent. And I says, Okay, what do you mean, over here? We have no access. He says, no, ball float, the ball floats right there. Okay, what's wrong with this picture? Um, hmm, if the ball floats, okay, the extractor's up there, the ball's sitting right here. Well, in order for the ball float to float up and close, that means the whole tank is filled, the vent line is filled all the way up to this point where the ball floats, and now the driver with his fill hose is full of product all the way up to this, at least this elevation. And being a diesel generator, uh, and he was doing a delivery at 2 o'clock in, in the morning, uh, he's stuck because now he's got product all the way up the vent line, all the way up his hose, and if he disconnects, he's got all his product and plus his product in his hose running across the property. Here we got an interesting situation. The bleed hole is corroded up. The bleed, I mean, and besides that, the cage here had rusted so much that it had actually broken. This is six years old in a fiberglass tank. Being diesel, what's happening is, what we're finding is, that if they're not keeping good or proper care of keeping the water out of diesel, we're having heavy corrosion. And being a fiberglass tank, there's very little steel inside that tank, so it was heavily attacking whatever steel there was, which happens to be the ball float. 
so much so it corroded right through. All right, I did an inspection. I was covering for one of the other inspectors, and I, I, I looked at this site, and I says, okay, we're out behind the building. It's just, excuse me, a small tank. How do you deliver to this? Oh, we got a pedal truck come in, in every month or two and top this off. Uh, yes, but you have a ball float for overfill. You realize that that doesn't work. I, 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 I. Okay. Well, you need an audible visual arm. So I wrote them up. And next three years later, the inspector went out, and this is what they found. Anybody have a guess what this is? I'm listening. I don't hear anybody. Well, what it is is a scully whistle for above-ground tank. We do not allow this in New Hampshire, and it not, does not meet any requirements. For number one, a scully whistle does is it, it makes noise. And the problem at this site was even if it made noise, you wouldn't hear it because the vent line was another 30 feet across the parking lot up 15 feet in the air against, you know, next to a, a roadway. So if a truck went by and, and traffic went by, you'd never hear it. And the next thing is uh, we require both audible and visual. Uh, where's the visual? There's no light. So, of course, it definitely didn't meet our requirements. This this sign was at another installation I saw, and it was a red flag immediately saying, well, they're using an improper delivery method here. So we don't allow that. This site, I did an inspection, and I said, where is your audible visual alarm? Well, of course, you couldn't see it because it was all behind the brush. I came back three years. I wrote them up again because you still couldn't see it. And believe it or not, last summer when I went by to do an inspection, they finally cut the tree down and removed it, the stump and everything, so it wouldn't grow back. Because I kept growing back every three years and, and plugging the view. And this one I love. And like Ted was talking about, we got the light. We got the horn, except for it's in the basement. So the driver can't see the light, can't hear it either. So a lovely situation. Overflow that happened to us on a, I don't remember if it was diesel or heating oil now, at these two different sites, blew the product right out of the vent. And the driver was saying as I came there, I didn't overfill the tank. Look, look, I didn't overfill it. So we'd stick the tank. Yep, he didn't overfill the tank. So what happened? Anybody got a quick guess? Going, 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 gone. Well, what the situation was, the guy that did the delivery before him overfilled the tank. Really? Well, the guy before him overfilled the tank, product ran up into the vent. Now, the vent had a little sag in it. So when they used the product, that little sag uh, in the vent line there, there was a plug of oil that didn't get drained back to the tank because it was a sag. So when he, this guy came to do a delivery, product went in the tank, vapors and the product, I mean, excuse me, the vapors are going to go out the vent. Well, since there was that little bit of plug of product in there, guess where the plug of product went? Yeah, all right, up against the ceiling, down the wall. So it caused the release that way. That's another reason why we do not want to wet the inside top of the tanks or fill the vent lines. Here's an example. I did an inspection. We had uh, a request to go up there and do that because the site had been in temporary closure. They were opening it back up. They just bought it, and they didn't follow our required guidelines prior to putting a site back into, into um, service. And they did not install those flappers, I mean, did not inspect those flappers before they filled the tanks. And those flappers were stuck down, like I said, vertically. So the hinge was gunned up enough, so they've been closed and dried out, that they did not work. Okay, that was one problem. We found this in this exact scenario. This cap was blown right off, and the ATG, which is the automatic cage gauge float system right here, came up with such force, it popped this cap right off, because it apparently wasn't on tight, and this is all gasoline here. And what happened is the driver, unfortunately, number one, didn't go into the facility and look for what we require as a tank certificate to be posted. And if he had, he would have looked at it, got scratched his head and said, well, I came to fill three 10,000-gallon tanks, and the tank certificate says these are three 8,000-gallon tanks. So when you try to put 8,000 gallons into a 
I mean, 10,000 gallons into an 8,000 gallon tank, of course, it doesn't doesn't all fit. So they blew the cap off. They were lucky. Um, it was all contained because a lot of times these ATGs, you don't require that they be actually in physical sumps. Here we go. That above ground tank device, OPW 61 F stop. We in New Hampshire do approve use of these by waiver and waiver only, um, and they are. We require that they be set at 90% full. We'll see people with kerosene, heating oil, diesel, the small tanks uh, want to install this because they don't have access or another port in some of these small tanks put, uh, to put in that audible visual alarm, or they don't want to do the expands. And I say, FYI, yes, if you get the waiver and get approval, you cannot stick the tank. How are you going to get an inventory stick down through here? You can't. So you've got to have another way of a, of a port or something to stick the tank or another method to determine what the product level is before and after deliveries. So we do allow them, but by waiver. So hopefully that answers the question. Also in New Hampshire, most recently, we require that we inspect and test the day tanks because with us, what we've been finding and having problems is with a few of our day tanks is spilling out and overfilling these and we loved it uh, when they ran down the schoolroom corridor. So being that it is a, uh, a national fire protection, we are, under our regulations, we're able to go out and verify that these are working properly and set properly. So that's something to think about when you're doing the rules and regulations that you may want to consider day tanks that are attached to, generally we'll see them at generators or some of our heating oil, bigger schools and stuff for heating oil systems. But uh, it is attached to our UST systems and, and we, we regulate them now and, and check our overfill devices on those. So that's something to think about. If you have not, uh, you may want to think about uh, regulating those. Things to think about for consideration. In New Hampshire, we do require that the primary overfill device to be installed, because if it's a flapper valve, the owner is relying on it. If we go out, we have to look and see if there's ball floats there, because if there's a ball float there, of course, the flapper valve will not work. So we need to verify those. We also require plan review for product change. So if somebody is, is trying to take a diesel tank and now make it a gasoline tank, we want to review that, make sure all the materials are um, will work, and we won't have any problems with vents and so forth, uh, contamination, et cetera. We also, of course, I was saying alarms for your audible visual alarm having signage. You may want to think about that. You also may want to think about the lumens for your audible overfill alarm and your alarm times. Lumens are basically, what I'm saying is you, we require we have a, a visual light. You may want to Think about the size of the light or lumens because during the bright sunlight days, are you able? is the driver able to see it? So as an inspector, I look at that, can I fail it or do I prove it? Yeah, there's a light there, but is he going to, it comes on, yeah, is he, is he going to be able to actually see it? So again, we in New Hampshire require the complete shutoff at 95% and think about the restricted devices. We require ball flows at 90, of course. But for other restricted devices that we'll need to think about when we're redoing our regulation, of course, is when they're going to think about putting a restricted device somewhere else in the tank, such as in the fill, uh, will our regulations cover that and how we're going to regulate that. Again, day tanks and testing requirements on how you're going to write that regarding to the upcoming EPA regulations. Like in New Hampshire, we require removal. We actually require in writing that it physically has to be operated to make sure that it's working properly. We also have to measure it to make sure it's set at that 90, 95% properly. Again, pressure deliveries, red flag, because it's easy to blow your tank up, especially if you have ball floats. And if you have flappers that close, the pump never shuts off. And I wanted to mention here, this is the rules, if you want to look up New Hampshire rules and how we wrote some of the, the regulations, our regulations are definitely not perfect. There's a lot of things I like to see changed, of course, like everybody else probably would in their regulations, but we strive to uh, improve them every time we do them. So you're more than welcome to take a look at that and get some ideas, give me a call, 
you can talk about and say, well, this is what we do, and I would love some recommendations on how to strengthen some of our regulations up, too. So this is my first summary. We did talk about the operation, and, and Ted also talked about how it all works. And again, I strongly want to talk about you need to manually inspect to make sure we don't have drill holes, we don't have corrosion holes in those tubes. I showed you conditions and issues. I just want to report that in New Hampshire, one in four inspections, we have overfill issues that we could not resolve during the inspection, which to some people may say a lot. Some people may say that's not much. Well, keep in mind, uh, it's, it's, we have a contractor there generally when we do these inspections. And over the years, most of these contractors come out with overfill tubes and all floats and repair right then and there when we do our inspections before we even leave. So this is one in four is reports when they couldn't fix it. So we get a lot of our sites are, are resolved right then and there on, on the spot so we don't have to write them up and say they got further issues. But overfill is one of our number one items that we find in noncompliance in New Hampshire. So what I want to say is if you're not removing and inspecting, odds are that overfill device extremely high is not working properly, so it can cause a problem. So again, I want to ask a few more stop for a few more questions here. This is a, a lovely EPA picture where a guy's doing a fantastic delivery. Uh paying attention, but he's not paying attention in the proper way. As you can see, he overfilled the tank, got a big puddle. And also this guy here, he's doing a delivery and he's you know, just paying attention on the delivery. Yeah, sitting there reading. But So I want to stop again and see what we got for questions. Awesome. Well, thank you, Spruce. I know we, we set you up to cover a lot today, and uh, you did a great job doing that. I did get a, a couple more questions, and I'm keeping an eye on the time here. So I think, I think what we'll do is I'll hold these last couple questions uh, toward the end. I want to make sure we have uh, enough time for Nicole and Chuck uh, yep. to give to give their perspective. Um, so yeah, let me, let me hold on a couple of these questions. If we don't get to them, um, I can always find a way to send those to you afterwards, Bruce, and uh, we'll follow up that way. But uh, again, thank you so much. That was uh, amazing. So many so many good pictures. It's the best way for me to learn, at least. So I hope hope you folks out there enjoyed it. Um, that said, if you want me, I can run through the last you know six slides here just to quickly show some of the things, that, and then uh, we'll stop there. But I just soon show them some of the tools that I've seen made up that uh, the, the states that do their own inspections might get some ideas and hints. I'll just quickly run through those if that's okay. Yeah, let's do a, do a quick run through and then we'll, we'll move along. Okay. Uh, some of the quick tools that I've seen over the years that people have put together to get out some of these fittings. Um, just a clamp here holding this type, all kinds of little gadgets. So. If you see something here that might be of interest to you, you can always get back, as, as, like he says, this is all recorded. You can look at these later and get some ideas on equipment that you may have. I mean, just two, two wrenches together will actually take your adapter out. These roof tools will hook right on those nuts and stuff like that. And this happens to be part of an old trailer hitch. fits perfectly right over the nut. So there's a number of ways to get into this equipment that uh, people have come up with over the years. That said, I'm pretty much to the end. These are my dispensers that I have at the house. These are my yard lights for light up my driveway at night. So I'm an environmentalist. I believe in repurpose and reusing. So um, that's basically what I had to have and what I wanted to talk about to everybody. If anybody else has a question, like I said, we're going to move on and we'll deal, I can deal with that later. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much, Bruce. And uh, you folks can see on the screen there uh, Spruce's contact information, or you can always feel free to, to be in touch with me, and I can relay your questions to, to Spruce moving forward. Um, so again, thanks so much, Spruce, and we'll move move right, right along here. So uh, our next speaker, we're going to move over to our friends from the manufacturing side to talk some about um, their overfill equipment. So first we have Nicole Kepi. She is product manager with Franklin Fueling Systems. I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to, to you, Nicole.
All right, I think we can hear you now. All right. Can you hear me? All right. Yeah. <laughs> There's a All little right. bit of a switch over from the muting there. Okay, so um, as uh, as Drew had said, I'm, I'm, my name is Nicole Cappy. I'm the product manager with Franklin Fueling, and so I'm going to introduce um, all of you to the our overfill prevention valve. So this um, our overfill prevention valve, the Defender, um, is relatively new to the market. It was launched in 2015, and um, this was developed in response to what Franklin felt was an opportunity to um, just produce a better overall OPV device. In addition to improving the performance to various regulations that exist, um, we wanted to design um, a valve that was easier to install and maintain and test. And so this has worked um, a little bit differently than some of the other traditional valves you have on the market. So I'm going to go through what some of those differences are here for you. Okay, so, so first of all, um, let me see if I can actuate this highlighter here. I can point. Okay. So you'll notice right here um, this mechanism. This is um, a magnetic coupler that is used with this device. And so this is where it's a little bit different than the flapper or the, the flapper style that you saw um, in Spruce's uh, presentation where it kind of kicks out to the side. This device doesn't have that. So instead we have a magnetic coupler. So when the f you can see a little bit of the float exposed here. When, um, when the fuel tank level rises and the float rises, it actuates um, this magnetic coupler right here um, to, to produce, the, to transfer the, the external float motion to the internal valves and to close off the valve. Um, what this does for this device is to eliminate any penetrations through the body of the valve and that provides um, zero leak pass for escaping vapors. In this slide here, you can see what the valve looks like um, more inside. And here's the flapper mechanism right here. And you can see what it looks like open and what it looks like after primary closure. So this, and this valve can um, work in a variety of flow situations. It has a range of 25 to 370 gallons per minute. The valve is designed with primary shutoff that will act activate between 85 and 92 percent of the tank volume depending upon the tank size. And after the primary shutoff is actuated, the flow through the valve is limited to less than 8 gallons per minute and secondary po positive shutoff will then occur at 95 percent tank volume if the filling continues. So the reasoning behind this is that we want to allow the drivers the ability to empty um, the remaining fuel in their hose, but we don't want we want to avoid, um, as Spruce had talked about earlier, um, the ability to go beyond that if they by chance happen to have um, additional fuel left in their tank. We want to make sure that we meet the regulations of closing off at that 95% um, point. Another area where the Defender OPV is a little bit different is on installation. The Defender OPV uses a thread-on upper adapter. This allows us for to be compatible with multiple types of upper drop tubes from different types of man from different manufacturers. You'll see that it has two grooves here. So instead of using um, riveting and flaring, um, we use a roll crimp tool. The tool here that you see um, that we use can also be used to cut the drop tube. So right here is a device where you would either have the cutting tool or you would have the riveting tool that you would slide in there um, to do that. I'm going to go through these kind of quickly because I know we don't have a lot of time here. Um, insulation options. Um, OPVs can be um, installed in a couple different locations. For this valve, we can install it um, beneath the fill adapter, beneath the spill container, um, or within the spill container base. Um, so that third option within the spill, the spill container base, this is done quite frequently with our Defender um, series of spill containers. So you might see, the, you might see that um, in a variety of locations depending on your, what kind, type of spill container your customer is using. Now one of the critical things for an OPV device to work properly is that it's installed properly. So it's really important um, during installation to calculate properly where you're going to put that device. 
So this is just a little slide here showing um, how to calculate the 95% level for installation. Because remember, we want to achieve complete shutoff by 95%. So in the diagram there, you can see um, a couple of values. Your key one, your key values there are going to be A and B um, and X. So X is the length of the upper drop tube. Um, so we need to determine that first. So you're going to determine your, the length of your upper drop tube X. Then you're going to measure um, A. So dimension A is the distance from the seat surface of the upper drop tube to the inside of the top of the tank. This, is going to, this dimension is going to vary depending on the spill container used. And also, as the Spruce had mentioned earlier, you need to include the height of the man weight for a man weight application. That's very critical to getting the um, proper installation of your OPV device. So after you got those measurements, then what you're going to calculate is B. So B is going to tell you where you're going to install your device. To do this accurately, it's really critical that you use your calibration chart for your tank to determine what the 95% volume offset, offset will be. So there's an example of that on the left here. And in this example, um, the 95% level of, of your, or the size of your tank is going to be 9,753 gallons. So you can see that right down here on the bottom. So this is the, the reading you want to pay attention to right here. When you multiply that by the 95 by 95% using your worksheet over here, you're going to get 9,265, and that's what you're going to use to determine the volume height. So now you go back over here, and you find the closest value to your 9,265, which in this case is 9,262, and then it's going to tell you that your volume height that you need is 81 and one quarter inches. Now, of course, all of this information is in the installation manual for the Defender Series and also in our four-court guides if you have one of those. You don't need to memorize that. The next key thing that you're going to want to understand with the OPV is a remote testing tool. So the OPV, um, the Defender OPV has a unique way of testing. So we have this um, remote tool device, um, which you can see right here with a long stick and the end here, which contains a magnetic coupler, and that helps you to do that testing to make sure your flapper is working. So here we have the remote test tool. It has some extensions available to it, so you can make it as long as you need to. And then every OPV you have is going to have this, mag this magnet inside it to allow you to use this tool. So when you drop this tool down into the OPV, the OPV you hear kind of a click and feel a little bit of a pull, and you'll know that you have um, reached those magnets. And you raise the tool up about an inch and a half, and you'll see the flapper move. So that's how you can determine that your flapper mechanism is working. One of the other things we always want to test um, when, we in, when we're inspecting an, a valve is the, that it is, in fact, installed at the 95% level. So this can be done without, um, without removal from the tank. And it's a very simple calculation that you can see. Um, we have another worksheet um, available to do this right on the right-hand side here. And the first thing you're going to do is measure the distance from the top of the drop tube flange to the upper edge of the drop tube adapter. This is shown as measurement Z here. So you measure that. Again, this is with the OPV still installed. Um, next, you're going to measure the distance from the drop tube seal surface to the bottom of the tank. This will be known as dimension A. This, you'll see, this is what you would have seen in the previous um, the previous diagram that I showed you. You might already have this re information recorded in your installation record sheet if that is available. And then we're going to go back again and refer to the tank chart and record the 95% volume from it, which will be known as dimension B. So these are the similar to what we showed in, the, in installing the OPV and the other slides. Once you have these values, you take dimension A, subtract B, and then you'll have to subtract a 4.5 inch or 114 millimeter um, offset. That represents the 95% shutoff level offset. In the end, you'll get the value from this calculation right here. And if this value equals your original measurement of dimension Z, then this would indicate that the valve is correctly installed. 
Again, all of this is available in the installation manual and our forecourt guides if you have one of those available to you. Um, those are the basics of the Defender OPV. Um, so some of the key points that you will want to remember is um, that, the op that the Defender uses a magnetic coupler, which works a little bit different than that flapper that pops out on some of the traditional devices. And, um, you know, again, the primary shutoff at 90% and secondary at 95%. Um, and if you would like any more information related to the OPV or you want to check out our training materials, um, they are available online and you can use the link shown at the bottom right hand side of this, um, of this slide to do that or you can feel free to contact me. Um, I believe that Drew is providing all of that contact information to everybody. And at this time, I'll take any questions. All right, awesome. Well, thank you, Nicole. And I'm looking here um, just to confirm. It looks like the link is franklinfueling.com slash OPV. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, cool. Just for folks, if you couldn't see it, it's uh, franklinfueling.com slash OPV for more information on this. And um, I know Nicole went through some of those worksheets there that were really useful. So as a reminder, that this recording will be up um, in our archi archives as well if you wanted to kind of you know, fast forward through it and pause it on one of those slides to see some of the worksheets she uh, ran through there. Um, that was kind of a, a quick and dirty, and it was quick really and dirty. good summary. <laughs> yeah, so um, awesome. Well, well, thank you so much, Nicole. That's and the 15 minute version. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I, I will put uh, Nicole and the other panelists' um, contact info up on the end, like she was saying. So if, if there are any follow up questions, feel free. Um, follow up questions for Franklin Fueling and Nicole, send them my way. Contact Nicole and keep the uh, conversation going there. So thank you so much, Nicole. You're welcome. All right, well, our final uh, speaker for the day, also uh, from the manufacturing side, uh, Chuck Liebal is the product manager at OPW Fueling Containment Systems. He's gonna talk more about some of their equipment. So I'll go ahead and hand it off to Chuck. Hello, Drew. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Excellent. Um, yeah, so as, uh, as Drew said, my name is Chuck Liebal, and I'm the uh, below ground product manager for OPW. And uh, first off, I want to thank you for inviting me to present today. You know, I feel this is a really big honor. Um, so just to provide a really quick overview of our company as we begin, um, as many of you know, OPW is a leading provider of fuel handling equipment uh, worldwide. We provide end-to-end -end solutions globally with manufacturing and sales presence in 15 countries around the world. And our below uh, ground division, where I work out of, is headquartered in Smithfield, North Carolina, which is just outside of Raleigh. So the products that we manufacture in our facility uh, include uh, piping systems, uh, dispenser containment sumps in both fiberglass and polyethylene. Uh, we make uh, tank sumps in both uh, fiberglass and polyethylene, uh, emergency shear valves, spill containers, multi-port containment systems, manhole covers, Allen forms. And, uh, you know, of course, the subject of today's conversation, overfill prevention valves. And uh, that's what I'm here to uh, talk about today. So uh, to start with, I was going to go through and review, uh, you know, briefly how the ball floats uh, uh, work as a uh, overfill prevention uh, detector. But uh, really, Spruce and Ted did an excellent job of uh, going over that and identifying all this. So, uh, you know, just, just as they said uh, how these work, you know, these work as a restricting device. Uh, through uh, vent, uh, vapors exiting the phase one vapor recovery system. And, uh, you know, I think they did an excellent job of outlining that. You know, I show in uh, this diagram, you know, how these are installed inside of the extractor fitting for the uh, phase one vapor recovery system. And then at the bottom center uh, photo, I show a photo of this from inside of a cutaway tank, uh, how it's positioned. And uh, this shows a different attachment method for the ball float being attached to that lower tube. So uh, moving on, uh, I was just going to touch on real quick, you know, uh, some of the uh, maintenance and inspection uh, aspects of this. Um, you know, uh, you know, again, as uh, Spruce said, you know, the real downside to the technology of ball floats is that it requires the driver to really recognize this and shut off the valve for the fuel delivery to the underground tank. You know, if the driver doesn't recognize that, the tank can overfill, and, you know, that's a big problem. So uh, the new regulations no longer allow ball flows to be installed as a primary overfill prevention device, but you know we know many marketers use this as a backup to the system, though. And uh, a really key element 
for, uh, for recognizing when using this as a backup to the system is to make sure that this is set to be shut off at a higher capacity than the overfill prevention valve setting. You know, meaning that this needs to be uh, set above the overfill prevention valve setting as I show on the left-hand side of the photo over there. Um, this prevents the fuel from flowing at a very low flow rate that may not activate the overfill prevention device no matter who that manufacturer is. It's a uh, really important uh, aspect to this. Uh, as far as preventative maintenance on ball floats, um, we recommend every three years to remove and inspect the valve, uh, you know, inspect this for damage, corrosion, make sure that the ball is moving freely, all the components are there, and, uh, you know, make sure that the pressure relief valve or bleed orifice is intact. And, uh, you know, again, Spruce did a really good job of, of uh, pointing this out, and I show that bleed orifice on the right-hand photo. Um, and to remove this valve, uh, to make this easier, we have an extractor wrench, which I show in center. And then I show in the middle photo over here what it looks like to see the ball float from inside of a spill container when it's installed. So next, I was going to go over uh, really briefly how the 71SO overfill uh, prevention device works. Um, this is what uh, has been referred to as the flapper valve. And this does use a float on the end of a lever in order to generate a good amount of torque to uh, overcome any, you know, sort of uh, like, like fuel or, uh, you know, uh, debris inside of that, inside of that area. So um, the way that this uh, valve works is that it's set in the fuel location of the tank. And as a fuel delivery driver drops fuel into the USD, the fuel level lifts the float arm up. You know, when the float arm reaches just before horizontal, the main poppet in the valve on the inside uh, moves the valve poppet past the protective bend, as, uh, as Bruce uh, pointed out, and it, the flow catches that and slams the primary uh, valve close. And this initiates a hose hick uh, that the driver recognizes that the tank is nearing the uh, fill point of the tank, and they shut off the valve that delivers fuel to the UST. Yeah, at this stage, the main poppet is closed, but the secondary poppet remains open and allows the fuel in the hose to drain out at about a rate of three to five GPM. And that prevents uh, fuel from releasing uh, during the disconnection to the inlet adapter. But if the driver doesn't shut off fuel for whatever reason, not recognizing the kick, fuel continues to enter the tank at that slower flow rate until that float arm gets to horizontal. At that point, the secondary poppet cuts off and no more fuel can enter into the tank, thus preventing any overfill and keeping any fluid from getting to the top of that uh, tank top. So in 2012, we introduced to the market the first testable version of an overfill prevention valve in anticipation of the uh, new testing requirements. And the idea behind this product is to, uh, to allow uh, the users to be able to easily functionally test this valve while installed in the tank. This eliminates the need to remove the valve from the tank and thus re reduces some of the risk of damaging the valve as we saw in some photos, or more importantly, damaging it during the reinstallation post-inspection. And additionally, this really eliminates also having to remove the many sealed components of the tank top system, you know, meaning the uh, inlet adapters, the jack screw kits, face seal adapters, um, that you need to have a, a uh, vapor tight tank. And at the end of this, you know, you would have to, to reconfigure and retighten everything down to make sure you have a vapor tight tank afterwards. Additionally, just one comment on this too, uh, some of the holes that you see in the overfill valve should be caught during the vapor tight tank test to make sure that there are no um, leak paths within that overfill valve out into the ullage of the tank. So overall, we estimate that, uh, that this functional uh, test from inside of the, uh, of the valve without having to remove it reduces uh, two contractors about an hour of time, and it reduces this down to about a five-minute single test for one, for one tester. And we do have CARB approval, EVR approval on this test system. So to just briefly uh, talk about how this uh, testable uh, overfill valve works, um, first, the tester removes the cover from the spill container as well as the fill adapter cover. And then they snap a uh, standard quarter-inch socket extension into the test plug that's attached to the, uh, to the inlet tube. This snaps in just like a regular socket. They unscrew the, uh, the, the socket from the inlet tube, and then they lift up on that socket. And when, uh, when they lift up on that socket extension, the cable that's attached to that is also attached to the float arm. The float arm rises up, and then the user looks inside of the overfill valve 
um, and can verify that the valve is functioning by seeing that valve flapper close from inside of the tube. Once that's verified, the tester can then thread that test plug back into the adapter and thus completing the test without having to remove anything from the system. And this shows this, uh, these three stages of this test over here. And on the lower right-hand uh, picture, you can see that valve moving past that protective bend, indicating that, um, that the valve is functioning correctly. We also include now instructions on how to verify the shutoff level, as well as the cut length of the bottom uh, lower tube uh, from inside of the valve without having to remove this. And you know, this is really done kind of like how Nicole uh, walk through on, on the steps that, that they provide uh, these instructions uh, through taking simple measurements using a measuring tape and, and reference points shown on the instruction guide and comparing this to the uh, tank volume chart. So these values are plugged into our simple workbook and out of this you get the calculation of what uh, percentage that the valve is situated to shut off on. It's really just sort of doing the reverse of doing the installation uh, calculation uh, for, for, for installing this tube. So, uh, you know, some of the frequently asked questions that we get uh, is, uh, does the test plug interfere with the jack screw assembly? So, in EVR locations, this is an important, you know, question that we often get. And the answer is no. The, uh, you can see the, the blue um, uh, inlet adapter over there is situated actually within that jack screw assembly. So, you can still access the jack screw assembly to tighten that down to, uh, to the EVR torque requirements, but you can also get access to that test plug pretty easily. Uh, second one, is there a special tool required to be able to perform this functional test? And uh, that answer is also no. Uh, you just need a single, uh, you know, quarter-inch socket extension that, you know, anybody has at that point. So anybody can test this valve whenever you need it. It's not just a, a special tool needed for that. And then uh, another question we often get is, uh, you know, how, how does the test cable uh, deal in the corrosive environments or aggressive environments that are in the tank risers? Because we all see a lot of corrosion within tank risers. And uh, actually, we use a 300 series stainless steel cable that doesn't corrode. So we have a very strong, very corrosion-proof cable uh, for this application. Um, because it's a uh, thin-looking cable, people ask us, does that cable break? Does it snap off? And, uh, you know, again, the answer for this is no, because it's a very, you know, strong stainless steel cable. You know, it takes over 70 pounds of tensile strength to, to break that cable. It's a very strong cable in that application. So uh, a frequent asked question, uh, question to us is, does this test cable uh, actually pull on the float or the bracket? And the answer to that is it's both, because the float is actually overmolded uh, over the bracket and actually through the bracket. So the cable is attached to, to this bracket that is infused into uh, this float arm. Lifting up on that bracket is exactly like lifting uh, up on the float. We actually did a test, as you can see, uh, where we pulled on the float arm uh, trying to separate that from the bracket, and it takes several hundred pounds of force to really separate that float off of that bracket in that situation. And uh, one last question that I often get as well, too, is, uh, you know, what happens if the float arm and the linkage is broken off of the uh, overfill valve with the cable attached to this? So in that situation, when you lift up on that whole float arm in the bracket and it's not attached to the valve, nothing happens on the inside of the valve you actually wouldn't see that valve close past that protective bend, thus validating that there is an issue going on with that valve and it needs to be pulled and addressed at that, that, at that time. So uh, that, that's all the uh, presentation that I had as well right now, so I'm ready for uh, any questions. All right, well, thank you, Chuck, and I, I like the uh, FAQ there, kind of helped you maybe nip some questions uh, from the front end there. Um, that was great, that was great, thank you so much. Well, I'll give it a minute here. I know we're a couple minutes over time, probably for my um, brief delay at the beginning here. But if there are any last-minute questions for um, Nicole or Chuck, since they kind of rounded us off and, and did some quick summaries, I'll give it a minute or two here. And I can hear some folks starting to, to log off, but I'll give it a minute or two before we wrap up for, for any final questions. So send them my way if you have any.
I'll take the uh, the rapid uh, amount of log offs as a signal here. Uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up. So, uh, I know I've already said it to each of you, but thanks so much uh, to all of our speakers, Ed, Bruce, Nicole, Chuck. Um, 